Consider a flow of water being split by a wedge as shown in the figure below. Both the wedge and the stream of water are very wide, by which I mean into and out of the screen here. They extend very far into the screen and out of the screen, which means that we are treating it as a two-dimensional problem. If the horizontal force required to keep this wedge stationary is 124 newtons, that's per meter into and out of the page, what is the angle of the wedge? This time around, I recognize that I have a force in the x direction, which means that I'm going to care about my x component of our conservation of momentum, and I don't have a control volume defined this time, so I will define my own. I'm going to call my inlet state 1, I'm going to call this top outlet state 2, and the bottom outlet state 3. Furthermore, I was told an average velocity at state 1, and I'm going to assume that both states 2 and 3 have the same average velocity. Since I have incompressible flow, or I'm assuming incompressible flow, that means that the volumetric flow rate at state 1 has to equal the volumetric flow rate at state 2 plus the volumetric flow rate at state 3, because all of the mass flow rate that's entering has to leave for this to be steady state, which, by the way, I can also assume. What that means for our purposes here is that the cross-sectional area at state 2 and state 3 are each going to be half of the cross-sectional area of state 1. Because they have the same average velocity, and the volumetric flow rate entering must then leave, because I have the same mass flow rate entering and leaving, and I have incompressible flow. Therefore, whatever the height is in my control volume at state 1, half of that height is present at 2 and 3 each. Remember that for later. Next, I will write out my x component of our conservation of momentum. And then I can begin to simplify by neglecting terms that aren't relevant and simplifying my surface forces into whatever is actually appearing. Again, I have fx as my label for my force in the x direction. And I'm going to define my x axis as being positive to the right. That means that fx is in the negative direction. And again, to try to avoid confusion, I will give fx a different name. Um, let's go with Brian. Okay, so the Brian force is to the left, so I'm going to plug that in as a surface force. By the way, I'm plugging it in as a surface force because it's acting on the surface of my control volume. So negative Brian. Then, do I have any body forces? Well, remember, the only body force we consider is gravitational acceleration for now. Therefore, I only have to consider if gravity is relevant or not. I'm going to assume that gravitational acceleration is in the y direction and that I don't have any body forces at all in the x direction. So Brian plus zero, excuse me, negative Brian plus zero is equal to, then we have our volume and surface terms. Because I have steady state analysis, this entire term is going to disappear. And then, how many interfaces do I have water crossing the boundary in the x direction? How many ingress and egress points? How many orifices are present for the water to enter or exit my control volume in the x direction? That's right, there are three. I have state 1 and state 2 and state 3. So I'm going to write that out as three separate integrals. Okay, next I can begin to consider what's actually happening in each one of those three integrals. I've assumed incompressible flow, which means that our density is constant, so it can come out of the integral. Furthermore, the velocity, or rather the x component of velocity, is constant. It doesn't change with respect to area, because I'm assuming uniform flow everywhere. So states 1, 2, and 3 are all uniform flow. Basically, I'm saying those velocities of 6 meters per second are on average at that state point. With that assumption, the velocity comes out and I can collapse each of these three integrals into the magnitude of velocity times area. So that's going to be rho 1 times u1 times the x component of velocity of in state 1 times a1. Now is that a positive quantity or a negative quantity? That's right, it's negative. Why is it negative? Because the area vector and the velocity vector are in opposite directions. The area vector always points out. 
The velocity vector here is pointing in, which means that they are in opposite directions, so that collapses to a negative value. Then at state 2, I'm going to have rho 2 times u2 times the magnitude average velocity of 2 times area 2. Is that a positive or negative quantity? That's right, it's a positive quantity. Why? Because the area vector and velocity vector are in the same direction. Lastly, rho 3, u3, times average velocity at state 3, and then multiply by a3. And is that a positive or negative quantity? That's right, positive for the same reasons as state 2. The velocity vector and the area vector are in the same direction, therefore it's a positive quantity. All the densities are going to be the same because of incompressible flow. And I know that the density of water is going to be about 998 kilograms per cubic meter because I am assuming that the water is at standard temperature and pressure. That value comes from table A1 or A3 in your appendix. Okay, so I know row 1, I know row 2, I know row 3. I know the area at state 1 because it is a rectangular area that is 1 meter wide because we are describing the Brian force as 124 newtons, and that's per meter into and out of the page. Therefore, the cross-sectional area at state 1 is a rectangle that is 1 meter wide and 6 centimeters tall. Then, state 2 and state 3 are each going to have half of that cross-sectional area. So, just for our purposes here, I can write this as 1 meter times 6 centimeters, and then this as 0 0.5 times 1 meter times 6 centimeters. And that also applies to stop changing page on iPad. No. Okay, very slowly. A3, which is 1 half times 1 meter times 6 centimeters. Cool. For state 1, the average velocity at state 1 is the same as the x component of velocity at state 1. So these are both this velocity up here, which is given as 6 meters per second. And for state 2, the average velocity is still 6 meters per second. And for state 3, the average velocity is still 6 meters per second. However, the x component of velocity at states 2 and 3 is no longer 6 meters per second. Because that is at an angle. So the x component of that velocity is going to have a trigonometric term involved. This is theta over 2 and I can describe cosine of theta over 2 as the x component of that velocity, which I will describe as u, divided by 6 meters per second. Therefore, u2 is going to be 6 meters per second times cosine of theta over 2. And for state 3, the x component of that velocity is also going to be cosine of theta over 2 multiplied by 6 meters per second, because it's the same angular offset from the x direction, just in the opposite direction. So, here, I will plug in 6 meters per second multiplied by cosine of theta over 2, and that also applies over here. And this is all equal to the negative Brian force, which means I have everything I need to solve for theta. Just to make the algebra a little bit easier, I'm going to be referring to all of the instances of 6 meters per second as v bar, and I'm going to describe all of the areas in terms of a1. So at that point I have negative Brian force is equal to rho times negative, actually let's write that negative out front, negative rho 1 times v bar 1 squared times a1. And I will make a little bit more room here. 
plus row one times cosine of theta over two times v bar one times v bar one times a2, which is one half of a1. So I'll write that as one half times a1. And then in state three, I have plus rho times cosine of theta over two times v bar one times one half times a1. And again, that velocity is squared because one of them is appearing here and here, and the other one is appearing here. Does that make sense? So in state two, u2 is v bar one times cosine of theta over two, and then I'm multiplying that by the quantity v bar one times a2. Therefore, it simplifies down to density times cosine of theta over two times v bar one squared, and the area I'm writing in terms of a1 to reduce how many things I have to keep track of. Following that logic. Okay, cool. Then I can factor out v bar one squared and density and a1. So this is going to become v bar 1 squared times a1 times density times the quantity negative 1 plus cosine of theta over 2 times 1 half plus cosine of theta over 2 times 1 half. Cosine of theta over two times one half plus cosine of theta over two times one half is going to become one times cosine of theta over two. Therefore, that entire term inside the parentheses is going to be cosine of theta over two minus one. And again, that's multiplied by v bar one squared times a one times density of water. And I'm running out of room on this page, so I will create a new page. So I can say cosine of theta over 2 is equal to negative Brian divided by v bar one squared times a one times rho, keep writing one after that, kind of unnecessary. And then I'm adding one to that, therefore, theta is going to equal two times the arc cosine of one minus Brian over v bar one squared times a one times rho. And that's going to give us an answer. So I will take two times the arc cosine of one minus, our Brian force was 124 newtons. And I will point out that I am not writing that as newtons per one meter because we've already accounted for the fact that it's one meter wide in the area. So this is like we're analyzing a one meter wide section, so I don't actually care about newtons per meter right now. Does that make sense? Then I'm dividing by six meters per second, I think. Correct. Six meters per second. And then I square that. Then I'm multiplying by the cross sectional area at say one, which was six centimeters by one meter. So six centimeters times one meter. And then the density of water at standard temperature and pressure was 998 kilograms per cubic meter. And then I want a unitless proportion inside of the arc cosine so that I can end up with a theta term at the end. So I'm going to want to take one minus a unitless proportion, which means I need all of these dimensions to cancel. So I will break apart the Newton and do its components. And I will convert from centimeters into meters. And at that point, everything should cancel. Newton cancels newtons. Kilograms cancels kilograms. Second squared cancels second squared. 
centimeters cancels centimeters, and I have square meters, 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 canceling cubic meters and meters. Yay, I have a unitless proportion. Then the theta can be calculated. Uh, if my calculator will turn on, then I will remember that my calculator is in degrees. So two times arc cosine of 1 minus, and then two parentheses just to be safe, 124 times 100 divided by 6 squared times 6 times 998. And one more, let's see. And we get <laughs> two times the arc cosine of 12,698 divided by 13,473. I appreciate your accuracy calculator. We get about 39 degrees. So theta is 39.06 degrees.